Hey, what's going on, everybody? You are now tuned in to the Paging Dr. Shonda podcast, where we talk about all things related to Black people, the culture, and we talk about faith, too. Y'all know that's not a new topic here. So we have a very special guest today. I'm so excited to have here <laughs> uh, Miss Elizabeth. Is it Liba? Last yes, ma'am. Liba, right, that's so it. You got it. Hey, you okay. Yeah. Hey, you know, hey. Black women, we see each other. So I'm not surprised. Yes. That I yes. <laughs> of course you did. Of course. Of awesome. Course. So what do you want me to call you? You could just call me Liz. I love Thank to just go you. by my name, which is Liz. Even though people know me as Elizabeth and my mom calls me Elizabeth, pretty much all my friends, which I consider you now, call me Liz. Hey. So, Period. Awesome. <laughs> well, I definitely appreciate you accepting the invitation. It is Black History Month. So we're excited to it have you. Is. Yes, it is. <laughs> so Thank Liz, you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Ooh, that's a very good question. Well, what about me? I'm a self-professed social justice warrior. I love to advocate for Black women and the empowerment and liberation of Black folk in general. And my journey began, wow. I mean, I started on LinkedIn in 2020 and it really was more of a journey of a professional development. I've been in my, I'd been in my field at that point. Oh my gosh, probably, to, oh, oh almost two decades at that point. And it mm -hmm. really was like 2020, new year, new me. Let me just do some networking, meet more people that are in my industry, find out more best practices, things like that. COVID had happened um, very early in that year. And I started to just feel like, okay, I got to kind of make sure I'm in touch with all the different changes. We were pivoting to online mm -hmm. in higher education. So just wanted to stay abreast. And really that was a big blow, just knowing that, we weren't going to be in the classroom. We weren't going to be on campus. And I work in the corporate office of a, a career college uh, as a director. So there were a lot of things that were kind of top of mind as far as I was concerned. And then George Floyd was killed. Yeah. And with the murder of George Floyd, I really started thinking about my responsibility as an educator. Like, what should I do or what can I do to just not feel so helpless? Because people were protesting all across the country and people were asking questions like, is this America? This is not America. And my thought process is someone that had taught American literature uh, in college at the college level. I taught K through 12 and I taught uh, American history, uh, eighth grade. This is America. Historically speaking, America has had a lot of struggle, strife, challenge, and out and out genocide, slavery, hurt, abuse, pain, oppression. So all of that is American as apple pie, pretty much. And when people are saying this is not America, it just felt like, where did you go to school? Because that, if you crack open any history book, you'll see that. It to me that people that are leaders in corporate America, I'm like scrolling through my timeline and people that are, oh, VP of this, regional of that, hiring manager of this, are saying that they didn't realize that race, racial strife or struggle or oppression was a part of the black experience. I'm just like, that basically I, is the hallmark of the black experience in America, and especially me, because I'm like, I'm not even from here. I'm an immigrant. I'm from UK, born in London. I was raised in South Florida. So it just felt a little bit like, okay, people need to know. What would I do in my classroom if this was happening? I wasn't in my classroom because of COVID. I was teaching some classes online, but I really wasn't going to campus. So I just started to educate people online. I'm like, you know what? LinkedIn is where I'm at right now. I'm not really on Facebook or anywhere else. I'm just kind of here doing my little social networking. So I wasn't, I didn't have any fear about, oh, I shouldn't post about you know, Black history because people might think, there were people at my job that said that, like, oh, you post a lot of Black history stuff. Like, well, you better calm down. And I was just like, well, there's nothing for me to calm down about because I'm not looking for a job. And I don't really care. People think I'm ultra radical or black blackity black because I am so what's period so what <laughs> so that's literally what I started doing I had an education podcast a higher ed podcast and we had started getting a little traction and people had started following me but I wasn't necessarily concerned about whether people followed me or not I didn't go out set out to really advocate I just wanted to educate and mm -hmm. it just started to resonate with people because I was just like okay let's talk about black history let's talk about 
black oppression. Let's talk about slavery. Let's talk about all, all the things, police brutality. Let's talk about all these things, racial profiling that people are saying they weren't aware of. And let's look at historically how that has all played out. And after George Floyd was murdered, I posted every day on LinkedIn for like two years straight, sometimes multiple times a day. Cause I would wake up maybe at three o'clock in the morning and say, you know what, how come people don't know about maternal infant mortality rates and why black women are scared to have a baby that should be a happy time. And you're going in the hospital comparing notes with your aunt and your cousin and best friend. And you're like, Ooh, I should know that, you know, tell the nurse this and do this and make, take this precaution when the baby comes. There's a lot of things, shared experiences that just started to become very evident after George Floyd was murdered. And then really toward the end of 2021 was more like, okay, there isn't a revolution. There isn't going to be liberation. We're not going to have a whole restructuring of America. People mm -hmm. just seem to go back to, oh, well, you no, know, that happened. And now let's just go back to regular life. And I started to feel really burned out and stressed out from trying to educate people. I started to say, as a Black woman, a lot of the Black women I was talking to were expressing just how much of a burden was on their plate, how they were just trying to navigate corporate spaces and feeling overwhelmed, under pressure, underpaid, underappreciated. And I started to really think about that as a unifying, just a trait that was happening among, amongst the Black women that I was networking with on the platform and started to feel as though all of us were saying very similar things. All of us had similar experiences. Why was that? What was it in particular about the experience of Black women that was so similar? And I don't really think I had thought about it before only because I had only been exposed to black women in my area, black women, maybe my sorority, black women that I went to school with, high school, college, but never really thought about well, what's the unifying experience of black women across the country. But I started to see that women that I was meeting just online had the same story. And I didn't know these women. I had never interacted with these women, but all of our stories were identical. So I started to think that I wanted to explore that. And, and as an educator and a research writer. I teach English. So I teach anything in the English department, whether it's English comp for freshmen all the way up to gra almost gr really graduate level. But most of the time I've always taught up to um, seniors, which would be like research writing, professional writing. And as a professional, I always tell them, if you see a phenomenon or something's going on, you can't just tell me something's going on. What, why is that happening? And, and do you have any credible research stats, anything that's going to back up what you're saying? No one's just going to believe if you start saying stuff. So I just kind of took that example from what I tell my freshman student in a comp class, if they're writing a basic essay. If you have a point to make, you need to research it and figure out how to validate that point and use mm -hmm. that to back up what you were saying. And then that's how the book really started to come out and started to be formed. It was like me looking at, well, why do we have microaggressions? Why are we afraid to wear our natural hair? Why do we feel like we have imposter syndrome, but we never experienced that when we grew up in our communities and never felt like imposters until we went into predominantly white spaces? Why are we all saying we never had a mentor? All these different trends that were happening. Why are we code switching? Whatever was going on, I just started to try to figure out why. And that was how the book was developed. Just thinking of what was the reason that Black women were struggling? Why were we having mental health concerns? Why were we anxious and depressed and, and our lifespan is shorter, maternal outcomes, whatever, infant mortality rate, whatever it was, these things were coming from somewhere. They weren't just ident like they weren't like um, happening in a vacuum. So I wanted to try to figure out why and that's where the book came from. Just really a discovery mm -hmm. of me thinking about my own experience and trying to find a thread that would connect all the other women that I talked to and also a thread for all women across the diaspora. We're all connected. We're all very similar. We're all dealing with this. This is not a figment of our imagination. Why is this happening? And I wanted to lay it all out so that we could all, as a collective, understand that it's not us. It's something that is beyond us, and we need to understand it so we can function in it. I think that's so powerful um, because you just simply saying you know, the things that we've experienced in life, the things that we experience in the community and society isn't necessarily a product of us, our like flaws that we might have or us lacking certain skill sets. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, it's a matter of the, the system. Mm -hmm. I think that we would think about ourselves differently and give ourselves more grace if we saw it as a systemic issue as opposed to a, a me issue. Yeah. 
you hear a lot of times about the the pay equity and wage gap. So for example, black women's pay equity is September and it keeps moving forward further and further into the year, but it's September 21st, I believe is the date, but it is in September. So that means that it takes us an additional nine months into the following year to earn what a white male earned the previous year. So it takes us a year and nine months to earn the same thing because we're making like 50 something cents, 58 cents to a dollar that a white male earns. And a lot of the articles that came out around Black Women's Pay Equity Day were Black women need to advocate better for themselves. Black women need to learn to negotiate. And my thought process is, well, we wouldn't have to negotiate if we were just getting paid properly. So I think there is a lot of that time we see that in the Black community and we don't really question that. Why is it always victim blaming? If someone does something in, in, in the case of police brutality, racial profiling, uh, we saw it with George Floyd. We're seeing it now with Tyree Nichols, where it's like, oh, wait, you know, maybe this happened. Maybe he did. Th- what, what was happening? And it's like, it doesn't really matter. No one deserves that. So I think as black folk, we know these patterns are happening, but there tends to be, I think, a little bit for us. It's hard for us to even articulate because articulating it means we have to face the fact that we're living in a society that's inherently unfair. Civil rights movement put legislation in place, but people are still circumventing that legislation by saying they don't see what's happening and they don't understand it. They don't know it. And we're like, well, there's 50 50 billion studies that have been done. You want me to now come in and explain to you how you're hurting me, why you're hurting me. And then when I tell you it, you're telling me that's not happening and let's figure out some things, figure out what. And it started to, I feel like for me, it started to get frustrating that the the blame is being pointed back on black women for mm-hmm. for example not running households or being the head of households when we know that black men have always been targeted and a part of the school to prison pipeline and are literally being taken out of the household welfare policy even back in the 50s and 60s said you can't have a man living in a household if you want to get benefits and I know people that said, oh, I saw my mom doing that, you know? So when you talk about, well, black men, you know, stay with your woman and black women stop having kids out of wedlock, people want to have kids. And people even now, the birth rates are going down because people know they can't afford them yeah. or people know that marriage is not necessarily the, the outcome that they want for themselves, but they do want to have children. But we were specifically targeted to say, well, if you're trying to get welfare, where's your husband? And if he's in the household and he's not working, then we're, you can't get welfare. And those were things that were specifically targeted toward the black community. And then you turn around and take that stereotype and weaponize it and say, well, black women are aggressive. Black women are loud. Black women are this, black women are that. And I think a lot of those stereotypes, it does make us see ourselves differently. It does make us go into spaces and feel we have to work twice as hard or feel our voices are not valid feel like we're being looked at under a microscope, all those things that are happening and making us feel less than, it's not something that is an internal thing, which is why I said, let me break down imposter syndrome. I was talking to a black male colleague who's very very uh, well-respected and he's done a lot of things in IT and and as a, as a founder. And I was telling him, you know, I feel like maybe I have imposter syndrome. And he was like, wait, 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 imposter syndrome. What are you talking about? You're not an imposter. He's like, why do you call yourself? Why are you saying that you have imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know. I just feel kind of nervous when I'm going to these situations. I feel kind of scared. And this was in 2020. So this was after I had even been very vocal and outspoken and doing all this stuff and doing all this national publicity, been interviewed by me. Magazine, Forbes. And he's like, that doesn't make sense. I don't think you should say that about yourself. And I started to say, I don't know why I'm even saying that. So I started to research imposter syndrome and found that even all the studies were saying that most of the, the people that had imposter syndrome were women or people from historically excluded marginalized backgrounds. And it started to feel as though we really didn't have imposter syndrome. We were going into spaces and we were being treated like imposters. And that made us second guess ourselves. So I started saying, well, it's not imposter syndrome, it's imposter treatment. A syndrome is something that's coming from inside you. A syndrome is something that you have to fix because you got to get more confidence. And it really isn't that. Most of us that grew up in black neighborhoods, they were telling you, you better get an A. My parents, when we got a B, it was like, okay, that's good. But they, we always were expected to be excellent. Our teachers always uplifted us. I grew up in the south, uh, on the east side of Fort Lauderdale. So all my teachers mainly were black and they wore kente cloth and they told us we were kings and queens. 
we didn't have no imposter syndrome. We got into spaces where people were like, what are you doing here? Are you a diversity hire? Did you say affirmative action? That's what happened to me when I went into undergrad. People just were side-eyeing you because you were one of only one Black or two Black students in a class. And there was a sense that you didn't deserve to be there, especially if you were there on scholarship. And even scholarship recipients, we had to still be excellent. But there was always this cloud over your head, like I have to prove myself. So these are some of the things that were consistent across the board with Black women. And I really wanted to create more of it. And it's not when I say a Black woman, when I say I'm not yelling, a Black woman's guide to navigating the workplace. It's not like here's the three steps for you to like get the corner office. So some tips so that you can ne negotiate your salary. This is like more, this is how you boss up inside yourself. So you won't even think about, I got to negotiate my salary because you're going to go in there and boss up and you deserve that salary. And I've done that with my boss. Like I deserve a, a higher pay. Like this is why. I'm not even questioning why. Yeah. You know I'm, I mean? I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm because so probably struggling with that. I want to hear about that. Like how did yeah. you do that? Yeah, because I think what happens is we haven't done internal work and that's not our fault. We are we don't have time to do internal work. We are busy. We are stressed. We are thinking about all the different stressors and I think even since everything that's happened with the Tyree Nichols um the the brutality of that situation, it lets us know that as black folk, that is our like that is our worst nightmare and it is our experience that we don't ever go outside our house without having our head on a swivel. And the idea that under mm -hmm. all that stress that we still have to go into predominantly white spaces, I think I posted about the selling tenant. I'm like, y'all are saying that, you know, black neighborhoods and black and white crime and the hood and this and that. We're scared of y'all. I will walk through the hood by myself before I will go into some of these predominantly white spaces because that's where my fear really is. And there is a sense that those that are in the majority really don't have a sense of just how much anxiety we have going into an interview or walking into a boardroom where nobody looks like us and we know we're going to be scrutinized. And I think that internal work of us looking at why am I code switching? Why am I afraid to go in an interview with my Afro? Why do I think that, you know, if someone's talking over me, instead of me saying, hey, can you let me finish? It's better for me just to be quiet or just laugh it off like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. And it shouldn't happen. And I'm very big on, maybe because of also my education background, there is a sense that if you let people get away with bad behavior and don't correct it, it's just like in the classroom. If a student's disruptive and I just let them get away with it, that student is like, oh, okay, open season. Really and I think that's what Black women have been trained to do. Like, come on, this is a Black tax. No one cares about your tears. No one cares about, and it's not our parents' fault or our, our teacher's fault or our mentor's fault coaches, they did what they thought was needed for us to be able to survive in these predominantly white spaces. But some of the things that we're doing, carrying that burden, not speaking up, not correcting unprofessional behavior, it really is to our detriment. And my thought process is, if anything, if someone made a comment about like my boobs on a call, mm -hmm. I would be like, skirt, unprofessional, but yet someone can go I can go onto a call and if I have my Afro out, it's like, oh my God, you're Afro. And it's like, that is super unprofessional that I don't want to be the center of attention for the first five minutes of the meeting. It's an icebreaker. And I'm going to correct that. And I'm going to like either do a blank stare or, oh yeah. <laughs> and let that person feel uncomfortable. Because if you're going to make me uncomfortable and make me like the centerpiece of your little, you know, whatever your icebreaker or whatever people do when they do weird stuff like that, then I feel as though now it's my opportunity as a teachable moment to be like, well, this is just my regular hair that I actually have every day. So welcome to it or something that lets them know that I don't appreciate what they're doing. And then typically what I will say after a meeting is I'll say to my boss, hey, so just as he's interrupting me, can you like make sure that my my contributions are heard because I feel as though people are interrupting me when I'm trying to get my point out. I've said that up until like the past like month or so, even on the job. Cause so I'm big on educating people. I even told my boss what a microaggression is and what I don't accept and what I do accept because it's gotten to the point now where she will okay. interrupt if someone is doing something. I just stopped talking and she's like, wait a second. 
Liz is talking, let her finish, and then you can interject because I just she and then she'll get up, we'll get off the call and she'll be like, See, did you see? I checked them right away. Like we'll have our little one-on-one. -on -one. She's like, Did you see how I checked them? And I'm like, Thank you for that. Because it's like it gets to the point where people need to be held accountable. Yeah. And I think what has happened with us as black women is where we we do fall into that trope of the strong black woman. And, you know, we, we got to just take one for the team. We got to make sure we push forward, work twice as hard, all these things. Even Dick Gregory said that, and everyone knows him as a comedian, but he was also a civil rights um, activist. And he said, don't teach your kids to work twice as hard. Why should we have to work twice as hard? We work for free enough. We work, our legacy is building a country. And I think a lot of times it's like, well, stop bringing that up. We don't want to hear it. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't dinosaur days that this happened. So in everything that we've seen, in the past two years has shown us that we're still living with the repercussions of that. I was on a call yesterday and I talked about this idea that sometimes people say, well, I wasn't alive. I didn't have slaves. And my, my retort is I was, I wasn't alive either. Like I'm not gonna just pretend that everything is fine. I should just be happy to have a seat at the table. But when I get a seat at the table, you're talking over me, interrupting me, making me repeat my points, asking silly questions to derail me. In the classroom, I wouldn't accept that from a 19-year-old student. So why am I going to accept that from a middle-aged brad that has a master's degree? Like, I'm not doing it. It's, like, it's just that I think for me, it just got to a point where during COVID, especially, I was just tired. And I'm just like, you know what? I got to put this down on paper and let people see that it, it, in theory, I think a lot of times people say, I could never do that. If I do that, I'll have a target on my back. And my thought process, especially during COVID, I was we were going through a buyout with my school. Everything was up in the air. And I said, you know what? I'm about to start checking people because I'm irritated. And if someone has, I think in the hood, we learned this lesson. If someone try you and you let them try you, that means you got a target now on your back anyway, because that person like, oh, easy pickings. Mm -hmm. So I started to use a lot of hood rules in the, in the, in the C-suite. I'm like, you know, real G's moving silent. So it was like things that, you know, I would be planning with my coworkers. I'm just like, we are just going to do this. We're not even going to tell them anything. Let's just make our own plan and execute as needed. I think a lot of times we try to apply their rules yeah. to us and their rules will never suit us because we are not included in that. So I started to do a lot of the things, you know, it's almost like F around to find out some of that stuff that we do amongst each other that they're not privy to. Someone on LinkedIn said this, we know everything about them. They don't know anything about us because we are keeping everything hush, hush. It almost reminds me of slavery days. Like, Shh, let's, let's talk amongst each other, but mm -hmm. we can't let them know because we don't want them to get mad. Uh, no, I'm not. Like, why should I Why should I not want to hurt somebody's feelings if they don't care nothing about my feelings? I'm like, you know what? No, in my personal life, if you don't care about me, I don't care about you. So I think a lot of what I saw during COVID was I'm starting to bring my personal life, how I handle people in my regular outside of business hours, because we're blurring business and home. So I'm getting on here with a hair wrap on because I got twists in my hair right now and I don't feel like taking them out. So you getting a hair wrap. Everybody else got on a baseball cap and this and that. Why I can't have on a hair wrap? And I would just do whatever I felt like doing because I, at this point, if we're scared and feel like we can't be ourselves. We can't check someone that's hurting us because we're going to have a target on, my, on our back. You already have a target on your back when that person decided to try you because that's what you would do growing up. If mm -hmm. someone try you, you got to put them in their place and make sure they don't do it again. And I think we just forget all those rules when we get in corporate America. We like, we got to smile and grin and pretend it's okay. No, we didn't do that growing up. <laughs> No, it's like we like you said, like we, we kind of inadvertently uh, function in that that strong black woman role. Right. And just kind of like taking on taking everything on the chin, not checking anybody, not necessarily standing up for, um, you know, setting boundaries and standing up for ourselves in the workplace. I can imagine how many black women feel seen simply by you writing out some of uh, those things in your book, because I'm just like. While you were talking, I'm like, wow, that happened to me too. That happened to me too. Like that happened to me too. And I'm like, all of us, we all are dealing so with like that. <laughs> and it's so, it is so dysfunctional. It's, it's almost laughable how much we put up with. Yes. And my thought process is the more that we smiling and putting up with it. And it's, they still saying we angry. 
So my thought process is, I'll F around and find out you about to see angry because I'm now going to make you embarrassed. I've been smiling, letting you get away with stuff, and you still think I got an attitude. Okay, well, how about instead of me worrying about your feelings, I check you now, and I'm doing it in a calm manner. I'm not yelling. And that was really the, the whole crux of me saying the book, I'm not yelling, is we don't be yelling. We, we don't talk in normal level, and they, oh, my God, you're getting mad. I'm actually not mad. My voice has not changed an octave, but you're saying I'm mad. So it's like, to me, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of when I first got on LinkedIn and started posting and people like, oh, you're going to have a target on your bag. People are not going to want to work with you. And it was the opposite. The more that I just started keeping it real and being honest, people were flocking to me like, do you want to come speak at my company? Do you want to do this? Do you want to write a book? Do you want to do a podcast? So I feel like sometimes we, like the older people used to say when we were growing up, you blocking your blessing because it's like we up here trying to conform and configure ourselves into a figure eight of what society or quote unquote, what our elders or what people said we should be and what we should do. And it's not their fault. A lot of that is from, it is epigenic. It is generational trauma of us trying to just take the path of least resistance. But I think it's just what, like what Zora Neale Hurston said, if you smile while they're killing you, they'll say you like it. And I think that's what a lot of us do. We tend to smile, play it off, make a joke, act like stuff doesn't bother us. But then that person is like, oh, okay, no problems. It's that's not, there's nothing inappropriate about that. And they'll keep doing it. And mm -hmm. I think for us, empowering ourselves to understand the strength of our story. Like in the book, I just thought about, well, who am I at my core? What does that mean? How do I empower my voice so that my voice is seen and heard? What are some things I can do to enhance my community, my ability to just understand myself? I think a lot of us have stepped into spaces and our identity is so formed by what other people think that don't look anything like us, rather than us looking internally about what our own identity is and how we show up with that. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, you make a radical transformation and you're somebody totally different. It's actually reaching into who you really are at your core. And for a lot of us, we don't even know who that is because we've been code switching and pretending to be something different. For so long, we don't even know the power in our authentic selves. And that's really what the book was about. If you are feeling powerful in your authentic self, when W.E.B. Du Bois, a lot of my study about just life in general and what it means to be Black in America comes from his book, Souls of Black Folk. People tell me, what should I read? Eva Mix Candy, White Fragility. Have you read W.E.B. Du Bois, Souls of Black Folk? Because that's from 1903. I don't care nothing about stuff that was written today if you didn't even read the foundation, because he wrote that stuff. First black man to receive a PhD from Harvard. And when he got his PhD, he said, it was Harvard pleasure to have me there. He didn't say, thank you, Harvard, for giving me the opportunity. So it's like, we have to go into spaces where it's like, imagine that man, not even a generation out of slavery, 1903. Mm -hmm. So 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, which established separate but equal. Mm -hmm. 1865, slavery. And in 1903, he strutted across, got his doctor and said, yeah, y'all welcome. Like, I helped y'all out by being here. We need a boss up like that. If you go into a space and you're comfortable in yourself, I don't have to give you like a script to ask your, your boss for a raise. Because whatever you say, you're going to say it with confidence with your chest. And either they're going to do it or they're not. It or ain't no, oh, there's a target on my back. I shouldn't ask. No, that's why you should be asking. And then uh, for me, what happened was my boss knew I wasn't playing around and I got a race because it's like, I'm not going to just keep sitting here waiting for her. And I think we tend to do that. It, it is a sense that closed mouth don't get fed. Not that it's our fault, but I think a lot of times we are overlooked. We're overshadowed. People don't, you know, people taking our project, taking credit for it, not giving us a proper credit and all these things. It's not to take away from the fact that those environments should be more nurturing. They should give us credit. They should make sure our projects, we get a, the appropriate um, pay increase or whatever for it. But until that happens, what do we do when we go in them spaces? And for me, it's like, I'm not going to shrink down and bow my head down like, oh, 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. For what? For me to come in here and be stressed out because y'all won't recognize my talent? I walk Every time I go in a meeting, I'm like, well, let me tell you about what I did. I brag on myself. I don't even care anymore. Because I think what we've done is it's like this humble pie thing of don't, you know, don't rock the boat. Just be happy. You even got you a little job. You need to be glad. And you need to be, no, they need to be glad. I'm even gracing them with my presence. Because when I go in the corporate suite and I see the mediocrity that's in there, I'm like, Y'all need to be glad I'm even in here blessing y'all with these three gems I gave you. And I'm about to go back to my lunch or whatever when I log off the Zoom. And y'all better marinate on them three things that I told you. So it's like we have to be our biggest advocate and our biggest cheerleader and boss up. Because if we don't and we're sitting here waiting, like, oh, let's wait for DEI initiative to make this safe space. Because they're working on inclusion. When is that inclusion going to happen? Like for our great grandchildren, I need that today. So it's like we have to be more aware of just how much power we have. I think we don't necessarily give each other enough. And this is where this community comes in, like a podcast like this, where you're uplifting voices, finding different narratives. We need to hear other Black women's voices. We need to see yeah. other Black women that are successful. We need to pour into ourselves so we can really be nourished in navigate these spaces not with like oh let me figure out how to brown those so i can get a raise more so like let me know that i'm the shit so they should be giving me a raise like right. that's really the attitude not like oh what you know what what's the, that that whole idea of well black women the reason we're not getting paid is because we don't know how to negotiate that thing rub rubbed me the wrong way so bad people because, actually say that yeah it was plenty of people that posted that on the day of black pay, women's pay equity they was posting articles like black women not asking for the raise. And yeah, that's probably true. But why don't you just pay me the proper amount that you're paying Brad in accounting? And then I won't even have to read this article about what to do to get a, a raise because you're supposed to be paying me the same. And black women are the most educated in our demographic. We stay getting degrees. We stay working harder. We stay putting in long hours. That is without question. And there isn't anyone that usually encounters this. It doesn't say this person's dynamics. So this person is, you know, a trailblazer. This person is this, this person is that. So pay me like that. And Viola Davis said that. Pay me like Julia Roberts or whoever is getting those plum rolls and is getting just by the nature of who we are and what we look like. There's a sense that, oh, you don't need that. Like Oprah said, her boss said when she was in Baltimore. You don't need a raise. Like he, you know, he has a family. Do you have kids? Do you have a family? Why would I give you a raise? Oprah was like, well, we're doing the same job. So can't you pay me the same? Like you don't need it. They think that we don't deserve it. And it's like, we are more than worthy. We deserve it all. So why we have to have that attitude. I don't really care what people think about me because I know the excellence that I bring. And I think the last chapter in the book was just when I was talking about this idea that so not every space is for us. So we don't, go into a space like, oh, I need to be thankful. Thankful for what? Did you give me a paycheck? All these people getting laid off. Like, I don't have loyalty to any job because a job is not going to have loyalty to me. So we shouldn't go into That's a right. job like, oh, I'm grateful. Thank you for being. No, this is a job. This is just like, this is a transaction. And I think a lot of times we look at a job as our identity. And that, that was mm -hmm. back to chapter one. What is your identity? Your identity is not, oh, I'm a lawyer, because a lot of Black folk do that. Oh, I'm a lawyer. I went to this school. It's all about pedigree, and that does not get us anywhere. And at the mm -hmm. end of W.E.B. Du Bois, all, everything he did to go through and break all this down from a sociological standpoint, he had this moment where he they, they quoted him in an essay or article and it might have been in his second book where he said, you know what? I thought if I gave them all the information about how great we are, we would make progress and they would just see our value. But he's like, I just throw my hands up because it doesn't matter how much we educate them. They still don't see it. And I was, it was like brought tears to my eyes when I read that. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, this is one of the greatest men of our time. It's a brilliant double consciousness. He came up with that before we even knew about anti-racism or anti-blackness. He had a sense that we're walking in America and we're split in two. And all we're thinking about is what people that don't look like us see when they're looking at us. Like even this idea of that, a lot of us can't really articulate that today. And he knew that in 1903. And for him to be like, you know what? No matter what we do, we show them everything about how great we are. They will never accept it. 
And I think that really is a hard thing for us to really reckon with. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. We have to know our greatness. And if they don't want to know it, then maybe we just don't know, need to be in that space and find a space that's going to be better for us. Yeah. You know, I you making me want to reread uh, Souls of Black Folks. <laughs> I yeah, read- I have it right here on my shelf. It's like one of my most, uh, it's like that book. I read that my freshman year in college and it literally changed the way I thought because I was just like, this is what I've been struggling with. Like, this is why things are the way they are. But I don't think I really seriously unpacked it until George Floyd. And then even writing the book was when I really started to unpack a lot of these thought processes, how I talk to myself, what I think about myself, who I am and at my core, mm-hmm. a lot of it was tied up in where I went to school and what I do and how much I make. And at the end of the day, the, all that can be snuffed out in a minute. So what do I have at my core that makes mm-hmm. me who I am? So that it doesn't matter what someone says when they look at me, I am so powerful in who I am as a person. Honestly, when people doing the microaggressions and stuff like that, I feel sorry for them. I could see where Tyree Nichols' mother said she feels sorry for those boys that did that because something is wrong with them. They are sick individuals. Mm -hmm. So when people are doing things to me, it's not like I'm going to overlook it and not correct them. But at the end of the day, it's like I, in my mind, I'm like, hurt people, hurt people. Because you doing that, your little microaggression and interrupting me, you feel insecure. That has nothing to do with me. And that bad behavior, I'm not going to not correct it but I know it's coming from your insecurity. It has nothing to do. It's not nothing to do with, I'm not good enough or Mm -hmm. imposter syndrome. Maybe they they see, I don't know what I'm talking about. I do know what I'm talking about. You just feel some kind of way about it because you see a brown face and a brown body and a little Afro. And you wonder who is this uppity black girl in here telling me this stuff. I know better. And then a lot of times I let them ramble on and, and everyone's like confused. And then I said, so do you all want me to explain or do you want to continue? And then it's like they know I'm irritated, but I don't care because that person just rambled for 10 minutes and took my thunder and didn't even give you all the proper information. So can I proceed now? Using so, words correctly and everything. Using <laughs> words correctly. They'll ask it, get it coming back. And then they like, so Liz, can you elaborate? As I was saying, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to elaborate because there ain't no elaborate. What that person just said, didn't make sense. So I usually will do the same thing I do in the classroom. I will make sure that there's a verbal cue to let you know that what you did was inappropriate. And then I move forward. I pause a lot of times the same way I do in the classroom, because at my, at that point you're being disrespectful and you don't deserve my respect. Now, why am I going to cower down and respect somebody that does not respect me? And I Uh. think that's what we have to do. We have to kind of like put a stop in boundaries because our mental health is at risk. We're going into these spaces. Our edge is falling out. Sure. Our <laughs> edge is not together. Stress got migraine. <laughs> it's just too much. And I'm just like, but for that, I'm going to have to check people because I'm not going to go home and cry to my pillow because of what you did. It's like, it's unfair that we're the one. Like I've had situation before I adopted this. And even since where I'm like, Maybe I what I messed up. I shouldn't have said what if and you questioning your own self when you know you wasn't in the wrong. You sitting in your cube, like reviewing the conversation. Go to your coworker, girl. Was I yelling? Girl, if you was yelling, don't you think I would have tell you? Of course you wasn't yelling. It's like we go back and forth and we already know we're not in the wrong, but it's like a white face said it. They older, they got white hair, they sound like they voice is like they know what they talk about. They don't be knowing because they be mediocre. So it's like we have to really take more control of our own <laughs> of our own destiny and not let people define us and that's why the whole idea of I'm not yelling I'm not like you're not going to define my words for me you're not going to make it see- I've had people misinterpret what I say in like a corporate meeting oh Liz said such as it low Liz didn't I'm mm-hmm. quick to tell them correct them and say that's not what I said that's not what, what I meant what was such as such. I'm just not having it because I feel as though that has happened too long and I feel like a from a parent perspective and a classroom perspective it does not work. When you just say, oh, just let stuff go. You let stuff go before you know it. Your child is doing like a, a robbing a, a, a 7-Eleven. Right. You know what I mean? It's like as a parent, you know, you got to stop. Hey, you got to nip it in the bud. Right. Because otherwise you're going to be visiting your child in jail. We all know that from a parenting perspective. We all know mm-hmm. in the classroom, the teacher got to take control. And if your child is not doing something right, 
they're going to be corrected. We don't go down to school, let my child just do whatever they want. And when they're ready, they're going to stop. No, as a parent, we know that's not happening. So why are you going to a corporate meeting or any kind of meeting and think that you're just supposed to interrupt people, ask silly questions, derail? It's like, no, not appropriate. So that really was the, the, the meaning behind just having a book that laid everything out so that there's no confusion. Yeah. Black women are under attack and we're just, we need to be empowered with the knowledge to let us know it's not you, sis. It's not you just dealing with this by yourself. Statistics, study, study after study. McKinsey came out with a study. Brookings has done studies. It's studies across the board. Even CDC has done studies where they're talking about the stress that we're under. This is not a figment of our imagination. It is real. Just like when we saw a system policing where it doesn't matter who you put in that system, the system itself is corrupt. So it is going to have corrupt outcome. So we know corporate America has always marginalized, excluded black women. We're going into a space already knowing that. Don't expect that it's going to be a space that's going to be welcoming for you and nurturing. It will be great if you do have that. But a lot of times you're still going to deal with a Brad or a Chad or a Karen or a Becky, whoever that's doing things. How do you deal with that? Because until you decide you want to leave and go somewhere else or if you want to start your own thing, whatever the case may be, you still need to have that boss up mentality that you are everything. It doesn't really matter what somebody says about you. Why didn't I have your book when I was in grad school? Because I don't <laughs> I had the Brads and the Chads and the carrots. Like I had all of that. And yeah, we all have. In my life where I didn't know how to manage it. And yeah. that's when the edges start coming out. But yeah, trust me. I've been trying to put some uh some tea tree oil on mine. I'm like, I need to get these things back because these people are stressing me out. Child, uh, yes. we all have been you, there. Yes. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say we all have been there, and I think the biggest thing is we need to share these stories so we yes. don't feel like we're by ourselves. Can you please let us know where we can get your book? Because I think it's, it's blessing so many people. Yeah, the book is available. It's pretty much everywhere books are sold. So right now it is on Amazon. It's also sold in Target, Walmart, Barnes & Noble. Pretty much every major bookseller has it. Some stores have it in on the shelves because people saw me, told me they saw it in Barnes & Noble. But probably for most people, the quickest way to get it is to order it on Amazon. My publisher has it and they have usually like a discount or something like that. But the quickest way is just to order it on Amazon. It's doing really well. Right now it's bundled with Michelle Obama's book. And I made a joke. I said, oh, first y'all was bundling me. They had me just bundled with Michelle Obama. I said, y'all done threw Meghan Markle husband in the mix. So now it's, it's bundled with his book too. So we got to see. I said, can y'all get me bundled with Viola Davis? But I don't know what's happening. But so yeah, it is doing really well so far. So good. And I appreciate the support. I appreciate you having me come yes. on and talk about it. Because these are the lessons that we need to share amongst each other so we can all be stronger. We are stronger together. And I'm big on bigging up Black women. I'm big on amplifying our voices. I'm big on empowering us, liberation. It's not about waiting for someone to come save us. We need to save each other and love on each other. And that's literally what this book is. I said it was my love letter to Black women. It's also my love letter to myself because I was feeling a lot of the kind of way, not even some kind of way, a lot of a way about a lot of the things that were happening to me. And I wanted to make sure that we share this knowledge so that all of us can grow and learn and be better and stronger. I love it. And you're doing the work, sis. I love it. I really appreciate you coming today. Um, so make sure y'all go out and get her book. Uh, the fact that it's bundled with Michelle Obama's book, like that tells you everything that you need to know. Um, can you let us know where, where else we can find you? I know you're on LinkedIn. And if you have any other like social medias or what have you. The main place to find me is on LinkedIn. I am on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Twitter. I'm, on, I'm not yelling is my screen name or my profile name pretty much everywhere other than LinkedIn, which my first and last name. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. So yeah, just follow me on all those platforms. I'm always happy to talk to people, connect with people, chat about everything that the book brings up and, and just be there as a source of inspiration for people that want to figure out how to empower their voices. 
I love it. Thank you so much, Liz, for coming on today. Um, make sure y'all support her. Of course. Make sure y'all support her. And don't forget, we're celebrating Black History Month all month long. So make sure that you're tuning into the audio version of the podcast on Wednesdays and the video version on Thursdays. God bless y'all. And make sure you remember you have the power to create the emotions that you want to experience. All right, y'all. Till next time. <laughs>